Right, okay. Um, I'm James. Um, I work at a company called Business Optics. Um, it's a company I started, uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, I'm here to talk about using C++ and Python together and how to do it in a sort of practical way for reasonably large projects. Um, the talk isn't going to be super, super technical like um, maybe some of the sort of PyPy talks and CPython talks. Um, so you don't have to have an in-depth understanding of the interpreters or compilers or an in-depth knowledge of C++. Um, you should probably know what C++ is and maybe have written some C++ before. Um, that would help. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go through code examples and stuff like that. Uh, but at the end of it, you should have a broad idea of how to practically use a large chunk of C++ with a large chunk of Python in lots of different ways. Um, okay, also we're using CPython in this, not PyPy or any of the more exotic compilers. Um, so it's probably not applicable to the other implementations. We use Linux, though it really shouldn't matter, and we use GCC to compile. And that really, really shouldn't matter, though invariably always does. Um, okay, so let's get going. Firstly, why would you want to use C++? And the standard answer is for performance. And sometimes this is true, and sometimes it's not true at all. But often, more importantly, there are really cool libraries in C++ that you'll want to access in Python. And there just won't be a nice sort of, well, there won't be wrappings for them, or it'll be your own library, and you're sort of modernizing your code, or putting something onto the web, and you want to use Django, which was our case. Um, and sometimes you want to do it the other way around. You want to use Python as some sort of embedded scripting or extension language inside your bigger C++ libraries. Okay. So this was our problem. We have this sort of reasonably complex C++ computation engine in the middle of there. I really love laser pointers. Um, and we wanted to expose it um, via the Django to sort of the web. Um, but we also wanted to embed a hell of a lot of machine learning stuff that we didn't want to write ourselves. So we used the scikit-learn libraries, which are these really cool Python machine learning libraries that have been developed in the last about two or three years. But that had to interface directly with our C++ as well. So it's sort of Python with C++ inside it, with Python inside it. So it's embedding and extending both ways. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is using C++ in Python, what we call extending Python, or writing extension modules. And the basic idea is you've got some class in C++, and you want to use it like it's just a native Python object. And it should feel like a Python object when you sort of use the len function over it, it should return the length. Um, you should be able to iterate over things that seem to be iterable. Um, you shouldn't have to have random strings denoting types or anything like that in your code. It should just look and feel like Python. I think my click, okay, there, okay. So fundamentally, how, how you go about this is you write a shared object or sort of create a shared object. And in Linux, that'll be a sort of .so file. In Windows, it'll be a DLL, dynamic link library, uh, and in Mac, I have absolutely no idea, but I'm, okay, cool. Um, now, CPython is written in C and has, and this is definitely an in inverted commas, native support for writing C extensions to it, uh, and this is accessed through python.h, and this is what python.h code looks like. Um, it's got lots of pointers and things in capital letters and strange symbols and I think all that code just calls one function or something like that. But it's, it's really low level, it's not nice to use. And I mean, down here there's even sort of boilerplate just to return none and strange things. It's, it's unless you're sort of a low level C Python hacker, it's almost impossible to use. Um, I have to point this thing. I think the batteries run flat on this. 
Uh, okay. Cool. Um, okay, so there are these great libraries called Boost, and these are, it's sort of the attempt to write a, a larger standard library for C++. So there's sort of a Boost everything. There's a Boost graph library, there's Boost smart pointers, there's Boost graphics, Boost networking, um, there's a Boost parser generator, and one of the things is this Boost Python library. Now, it's firstly, it's C++, not C, um, which is nice if you're working in C++. Um, it's pure C++, so there's no strange interface definition languages or sort of sub-mini languages or configuration files you have to get used to. Uh, it works really nicely with the rest of Boost. And if, if you're writing a sizable C++ project and you're not using Boost, you're probably doing something wrong unless you're writing embedded code. That's probably the only time you shouldn't be using Boost. Um, okay, and it takes care of a lot of the details for you. So to wrap something in Boost Python, it's pretty clear and it's pretty declarative. So sort of as an example from the previous example I showed with the fortune teller, um, got sort of the class there, give it a name, you say sort of what method you want exposed on it, put it in this little Python module thing. Um, and it's pretty clear. You can sort of get to grips with that. You don't need a sort of PhD in compilers. Uh, but when you have a reasonably large library, something with maybe 30 or 40 different objects, um, 20 methods on each object, this is still, this is incredibly boring um, code to write. And I, I really hate being bored. So there's a way to automatically generate that code based on the sort of header files uh, of your C++. And this is a thing called Py++. Uh, so the idea is you pass it the header files of your um, sort of C++ project. It will spit out a whole bunch of C++ code that you then compile, and you have a beautiful extension module, and everything works perfectly. Um, it's pretty comprehensive. It got to a stable state, and then everyone sort of stopped maintaining it. So it's just stuck at version 1.0 for about three years now. Uh, if you put a question on Stack Overflow, someone will get back to you eventually. But um, if anyone's really looking for an open source project, um, this one needs a new maintainer. So any takers. Um, cool. So that's, that was our sort of first basic strategy. Get our header files, put them into Py++ get C source wrappings out, compile them, get our module, which is nice, easy, and a complete disaster. Um, so we just came out with this one massive C module that, that didn't compile, sort of had to be handcrafted. It ended up being sort of two and a half thousand lines of half generated code, half handcrafted. When you made changes, you'd have to generate a new version and then remember where you had made changes and copy and paste those over from the old version. It was, it was the most horrible thing ever. It, it got so bad that we just wouldn't implement features because we were too afraid to change the Python wrappings. So uh, just development speed plummeted. And, and we had to upgrade our build server just so we could compile this file. Uh, so clearly we needed uh, a better solution or a trauma counselor. Um, and counselors are pretty uh, expensive. So we came up with a better solution. And sort of the next sort of body of the talk, how much have I talked for? Um, is basically about what those sort of tricks to actually get it to work were. Um, so firstly, we wrote something I'm calling a sort of domain specific language, but really it's just a bunch of Python methods that make you pretty declarative as to what you're trying to do. So instead of writing just a Py++ script, sort of write in these high-level methods. Um, and the important thing is to make it really explicit and clear so that when someone goes and changes the C++ code, they know exactly what they have to do to upgrade the Python wrappings. And it should be just changing one line or adding a line, nothing, no understanding of the sort of arcane internals. Uh, Okay, um, once again, okay, cool. OK, 
Okay, so the first thing we learned is don't expose every single thing in your C++ to Python. And by default, Py++ does this. Um, and the reason you don't want to do this is, is the same reason you have sort of public and private interfaces in all object-oriented programming. You want to be able to sort of limit the impact of changes you make. So if you explicitly choose what it is you want to expose, it's a lot easier to reason about what the ch sort of effects of changes are going to be um, when you change your underlying C++ code. And this is also pretty important because because C++ is statically typed and Python is dynamically typed, changes that you would normally catch at compilation time when you're used to working in C++ only become apparent much later in some obscure bug that crashes all your servers um, once you've exposed them to Python. Uh, yeah. The other thing is sometimes it's just too difficult to actually wrap a class. Um, this is especially true, um, I'll talk about some examples later. But sometimes they're really natural Python analogs to whatever you have in your C++. An example of this is sort of date time classes. Um, you've got this really complicated POSIX time construct in Boost, um, and this really natural, nice date time construct in Python. Now you could go around trying to wrap this stupidly complicated time construct, or you could just write something that sort of reads out the different integers from the one and constructs the other. Basically converting every time you have a parameter that would normally take some sort of POSIX time, you can put in a Python date time, it'll automatically convert it and call it, call your function with the converted arguments. And likewise when you return functions back. Uh, and there's, okay, there's a great sort of blog on how to do this. Um, so these are the examples, sort of some examples, because there are a few subtleties to it. Uh, so I went through the sort of date-time example, which worked really nicely. But then sometimes you try to do this and it fails completely. And one example here was with sets. Uh, so you have this sort of set construct in C++ uh, and a set construct in Python, and you should think that there'd be nice analogs for each other. But they're, in this case, they're pretty different. Um, Python sets are hash sets, um, whereas C++ sets are actually ordered trees. So there are a whole bunch of, sort of ordering constraints and very different subtle behavior. And it's also very expensive to convert between the two. And if your sort of overhead of calling C++ routines outweighs the performance gains you get from them, then, well, that's pretty pointless. Uh, so when you're converting stuff, you've uh, got to think about it a bit more cleverly. Um, the other trick we learned is really exploit the C preprocessor. Um, the C tree processor is ridiculously fast um, and it can speed up your compilation a lot. Uh, so where this really came in, in this case, uh, in good use, is instead of adding all our header files separately to Pi++, we just added them all into one header file, ran the preprocessor, which sort of cut out all the duplicates and you know, did everything incredibly quickly, and then just sent one file into um, Pi++, which uses GCC behind in the back end to sort of parse the thing and understand the thing, but it's a lot slower. Um, and that, yeah, that, that sped things up a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes your C++ library just needs a bit of help to get it to wrap properly. Um, and sometimes you have to go and either rewrite things in a slightly different way, um, and you can't always do that, so sometimes you have to write sort of wrapper functions around the other functions. And this is especially true when uh, so sort of the arguments that you want to take in a method don't naturally fit uh, with how Python would like to do things. And this is often true when you want to pass a list into a method. Uh, and it's often in a C++, I've got an example in the next one. Okay, that's probably too small to see, um, but I'll just talk through it. In C++, you'd often send like a vector of ints into a method or something like that. Uh, whereas in Python, you'd just want to send in a list, and you'd expect it just to work. You don't want to have to specially create some sort of typed container class. So basically what you do is Boost allows you to, uh, or Py++ rather, allows you to inject uh, custom C++ code into your wrappers, where you can take sort of the PyList object, iterate through it, extract. Um, sort of 
all the contained objects of the correct type, generate a vector, and then just call the underlying method. Uh, you should try to do this as little as possible, though, because it's just more code you have to maintain. And it ended up, the way we did it, was these sort of big string literals in a Python, uh, sort of in a Python script that had C++ code inside them. And that, that's pretty horrible, but it, it was pragmatic, I guess. Um, then there are also a bunch of subtleties. And this is, this is one of the big advantages to using Boost Python if you've used a lot of pointers or smart pointers, is that it'll work out a lot of this for you. But Python is a garbage collected language, so it uses sort of reference counting for everything. Uh, but your C++ stuff, you've probably got either your own reference counting system or some other sort of, you've explicitly sort of created and freed memory and done whatever tricks. And you don't want Python now either sort of taking control of those and then your garbage collection strategy and theirs are uh, incompatible and everything seg faults and your server crashes. Um, which seemed to be what happened for the first like five weeks of trying to get this right. Um, so 99% of the time it gets it right, but sometimes you have to give it a little help. Um, and these are what are called core policies. So it basically says the thing that is being returned from this method should be treated in some way. Um, the one important here is this return internal reference um, basically says that I'm some sort of child object, and please keep my parent object alive while I'm alive. Don't garbage collect it. Uh, so this would be the case, um, I don't know, if you have some sort of factory objects where created objects hold some reference to it. Um, Python can't know that, because that's all in your C++ code. But by doing this, you'll make sure that your sort of parent object doesn't get garbage collected, and then you null point a reference after that. Okay. That's, no, that was backwards. Um, OK, and then there's always the gil or jill. I don't know. People say it all sorts of different ways. Um, and you've probably, if everyone here has by now heard about this in one of the talks, um, it basically ensures that Python operations are atomic, or Python instructions are atomic, um, and screws up multi-threading completely. Uh, now, when you're writing C++ code, you're probably doing it because you want it to be fairly high performance, uh, and you probably want it to be able to run in parallel. Now, unfortunately, C operations, or call out to C libraries, are viewed as one atomic operation by the interpreter. So it'll lock up the entire un interpreter, wait until your full operation is finished, and then unlock it. And that's, that's fine if your operations are short, but if they're long running, like you're running some sort of stochastic model in C++ or something that takes a couple of seconds or a minute, you're going to freeze up your entire well, web server, everything. Uh, so the way you do this, or fix this, is you can explicitly release the gil. Um, and this is also one of those cases where you have to write sort of nasty Python-specific C++ code um, in your wrappers, but it's just something you've got to do. Fortunately, this is one of the places where the sort of Python.h um, actually does have some high-level things. So there are these little macros, um, begin allow threads and end allow threads that you just have to put around your sort of long-running C++ code, and it'll it'll make everything work. Basically, release the gil, save the thread state to a hidden variable. Um, then later on, it'll load that thread state and wait until it can acquire the gil again and then continue. Okay. And the last thing is, uh, now we, we wrote this whole C++ library always sort of with the idea that later on we're going to wrap it in Python and that was going to be really easy, um, which it wasn't. Uh, so we just had this huge library that we had to start wrapping. Um, if you know you're going to be writing some sort of hybrid system, Code, code, code with the fact that you're going to wrap it in mind from the beginning and probably start the sort of wrapping process early on um, so you sort of get your head around it. Uh, and also just be pragmatic. Sometimes a quick and nasty fix is okay if it's going to save you two weeks of writing some obscure system to convert things. It's, it's all right. Uh, Another really useful thing is to learn how to use GDB to debug a running Python process. 
uh, Stripe has a really great blog post on this. So basically you can run Python in debug mode inside GDB and step through each of the sort of C stack frames and eventually you get your own extension module code and you can debug what's happening inside there. Uh, because otherwise you just get sort of a seg fault somewhere and it's down through so many layers of Python into C++, it may be into Python again, you have no way of tracing it. So this takes a bit of setting up, but it's really useful to do. Um, and lastly, this is, this is a general point that I think everyone accepts now. Automate everything. Um, especially now, you'll have sort of Python code, and then you have Python code that generates C++ code. Maybe you have to pre-process some of your C++ code first. Then you have to compile that code. Um, if you don't automate that process, it slows your team down, and it makes them scared to do anything because it seems like a lot of work. And the, the loss in productivity is uh, just it's phenomenal how bad it is. Um, so in general, use some sort of build system. We use CMake, um, but you can use um, Sconstruct, which is a Python-based uh, system. But whatever it is, use it. Um, get a continuous integration server. Build these things. Uh, yeah do all those good things you're told to do by DevOps people. Um, but I won't go on about that. Okay, so the final system we had was sort of C++ header files all went into one C++ header file, which went into the sort of high level script we had that was using Pi++ under the hood. Um, had sort of, whoa. Uh, all our wrapping source files came out. Uh, we had CMake generate all the make files for that and then compile it and then we got something. So in the end, everything was completely automated. It was one script you ran that compiled everything, installed it to the right place, set everything up, all your debug flags. Um, compilation was way, way faster. You could run it on a little netbook if you wanted to. Um, and it was really easy to update, and everyone wasn't scared of breaking everything whenever you added a new feature. Um, cool. So that's the extension, which is the sort of bulk of it. The other is embedding, basically using um, Python inside your C++. And this is a lot easier. Uh, so that's, you can either embed an interpreter directly, sort of almost like a new interpreter inside your C++. Um, but that's not hell of a well supported. Um, or if you're already writing an extension module, you can just pass objects from your sort of uh, global interpreter, I suppose, into your extension module and then pass that back into sort of the Python world. And that's a lot easier to reason about and in most cases more useful. Uh, so here, Boost Python really helps again. It's got sort of a lot of primitives going the other way. Um, so you can write code that Python can understand and can use Python objects pretty much the same way you'd write Python code. So here's some sort of Python routine, and here would be the exact same routine in C++. But you can see, apart from sort of a few extra object definitions and some slight changes in syntax, it's basically the same thing. And this is what Booth Python allows and allows you to never have to touch Python.h. Uh, and it's, it's simple to use, you just, for instance, here you can sort of just call a method, set the type, it'll do type conversion for you um, based on your previous type conversions and a few automatic built-in ones. And that's, yeah, that's pretty nice. Uh, right. The one complexity here is now we have Python code running C++ code, which runs some more Python code. Uh, and we've previously released the gil um, over here, and then we try to run some more Python code, and that doesn't work. That just, once again, seg faults. Uh, but there are more, apparently, macros, not macros, um, to allow you to sort of reacquire the GIL, run some Python code, release the GIL again, run your C++ code. Uh, it's one of these things, though, try to play with the GIL as little as possible, because there's a set an overhead, it's some sort of spin lock or something um, there that has to wait to be acquired. Uh, 
also, if you screw it up, um, you just get random seg faults. Uh, if you've released it, you've got to make sure you acquire it. So if you're throwing exceptions or something like that, um, if there any, if you have code with multiple exit points, you've got to make sure you're managing that state fairly carefully. Uh, so if you can avoid having to play with it, do so almost at all costs. Uh, okay, um, so that's sort of sort of the overview of how you'd go about doing it, and hopefully most of the pitfalls are dealt with there. Uh, but sort of on a sort of high level note. Um, Python and C++ are good at different things. Um, this is sort of the performance of C++, um, and obviously Python is a much nicer language to use. C++ allows you to, well, really hang yourself in the most interesting sorts of ways. And you've got to sort of choose how much, how much is the increase in code performance worth compared to the sort of decrease in your team's sort of development speed performance. And the truth is, like, although Python is it's a bit slower than C++, it's actually pretty fast. It's probably fast enough for most things you want to do. Um, and although C++ is a bit of an ugly language, it's it's all right to use. I mean, it's it's a modern high-level language. Well, not a high-level language, but it's a modern language, not coding in Fortran. Um, so, yeah, sort of got to pick what's right for you. Um, and be sort of sure about that you really need to go through all this extra effort. Um, yeah, uh, but if you're going to do sort of hybrid code development, do it properly and think it through. Uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about is just some alternatives. Because uh, obviously this, the way we did it was just the way we did it. There are a number of sort of historical reasons we chose the technologies we did. Um, but there are a lot of other ways to do it. Uh, firstly, you can often, if you're writing Python code, just use a high-level library like NumPy, something that is very performance tweaked. They've done all the sort of C extensions for it. Uh, and you can probably get away with, with using sort of high-level performance libraries for almost everything you'd need. It's only if you're doing something reasonably esoteric or unique that you'd have to write your own C++ code. Uh, you could also, obviously, we've all seen a lot of PyPy, um, this conference. Uh, I wish it had been around about or more stable three years ago, and maybe I'd have gone a very different route. Uh, and they've also got, they've got a thing they call CPPYY or something like that. Um, that allows you to, similar to what we did with the Boost Python um, system, it allows you to create sort of C++ extensions a lot more easily. Uh, then there's Scython, and Scython's pretty interesting. So Scython is a sort of superset of the Python language where you can add a whole bunch of sort of type annotations and um, things like that. And it will actually go from your code that looks pretty much like Python code. And in fact, pure Python code would be legal Scython code. Um, it'll go generate C code for you um, that you can just compile straight into a C extension module. So uh, I know the SciPy project uses it a lot. Um, it's their sort of preferred way of creating C extension modules. And it, it means your programs don't have to learn a whole new language. Um, C++ has a lot of caveats and strange things you can do, especially for people who are more comfortable in dynamic languages. Uh, so it's definitely a good option. There's another thing called Weave, which allows you to, it seems to not have that much support anymore but sort of inline, sort of write C++ in string literals in your Python code, and it will to me, dynamically compile it, and then, yes, dynamically compile it and create an extension module while you're running your code or something like that. Um, but it's, uh, I think it was a sort of an experiment that didn't turn out so well. In terms of generating sort of multi-language uh, wrappings, there's always been SWIG. Um, it has one advantage that once you sort of, in theory, once you write the sort of swig interface for your library, you can generate wrappings for a number of languages like Ruby and Java and a whole bunch of things. But it requires you to work in this horrible interface definition language and it, it, it never really seems to work. Um, it's, it's really crap. <laughs> um, 
in, in my opinion. Um, it's, it's a lot of work. And the truth is, if you're, if you're wrapping a language, if you're wrapping a library for a language, you're probably going to want to have some language-specific tweaks so it feels natural in that language. Java feels different to Python, so you want your library to feel like Java and Java and Python and Python. Um, and then there's C types, which is the sort of native, uh, native weight, but it just calls C functions. Uh, so you can sort of extern your C++ code into C functions, but then you're basically writing a whole bunch of wrapper code. You eliminate all your sort of object orientation. Uh, it's good if you're just optimizing a few methods, um, uh, which is often the way you should go, just work out that sort of 80-20 rule. Um, but for any like, something that is a library rather than just an optimization, it's not hell of a useful. Um, cool. Okay. So those are my contact details. I'll put the slides up. Um, they were quite wordy because I wanted them to be a reasonable reference. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Uh, hmm. Around a simple, so do the TCP server in Python. Um, okay. Oh, okay. I mean, you could do that. Um, there's just the performance overhead of doing that may be prohibitive. Um, and also just the sort of natural feel for it. Uh, because then, once again, that's you'll lose a lot of your sort of object-oriented feel of your library. Um, because you'll basically just be sending commands and getting answers back uh, from it. So it's, it'll be more like the C-types interface in some sense. So if, if you can do that, that's great. What I think you'll probably find you'll end up doing is you'll do that and then write some sort of helper methods in Python, and then you'll extend those helper methods, and you'll end up creating sort of mock objects for your entire sort of C++, uh, C++ library that sort of generate calls to send to the TCP server, get them back, and make changes. So it, it, it may end up as quite a lot of work. Hmm. Hmm. Um, we're not, relative to the amount of computation done, we're not passing that much data between them um, in most cases. Uh, it is it was a huge problem in the beginning because we'd be sort of doing these sort of conversions in between types and uh, it was a problem. But what we ended up doing is creating sort of interface objects where we had a Python object that could read the data uh, from sort of our database or whatever data source and generate the sort of perfectly packed sort of C++ objects um, ready so there's no conversion overhead. Uh, Uh, in the end, what we actually ended up using is Celery. Um, so the reason the gill was sort of some legacy code using the threads, um, but also uh, it allowed us to create sort of a dev environment without having to spin up Celery. Um, we just created sort of a mock Celery using threads, uh, which we still use, but it's not that useful. Sure? Mm -hmm. um, so that I can work with Python. It's basically one big Fortran regime with a lot of vector parameters and a terminal vector. Um, do you have any suggestions of where I should do it? Uh, a swig will almost certainly be able to do it um, because it seems to be able to wrap from anything to anything. Um, if it's just one routine, uh, an easier way, because I think Fortran compiles down to sort of a C compatible um, sort of um, binary, so you can probably use C types for it. Uh, that. Mm. 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 Cool. Anyone else? I've been following LLVM for a while, um, and there's a lot of cool stuff there. But um, I think 
uh, I mean, especially like Pi++ is based on GCC XML, which is the most horrible hack kludge. I mean, the, the fact that you couldn't get decent XML out of GCC is almost why they wrote LLVM. Um, so I think you'll start to get some really nice, with a bit of effort, you could create a really nice tool chain around that, but it just hasn't been done to my knowledge yet. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Self, yeah. Good. I must check that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Mm. Uh, I'm always a bit skeptical of um, mixing two types of languages sort of in the same. It's also like I used to do um, assembly com uh, instructions in C files or C++ files. I think the, you can sort of break the programming metaphor very easily um, and it, it code becomes very difficult to reason about. But it, if you just need like one optimized loop, it's great. I'm um, sorry, someone, you had a question. Uh, in terms of performance? Oh, okay. Uh, it's decomposed into, okay, the boost Python itself. Um, oh. it, it probably pulls in quite a lot of stuff because it uses under the hood these, there's sort of a boost functional library that has a whole bunch of sort of variance and sort of dynamic typing stuff uh, and I imagine that's probably pretty heavy but it is it's whole of boost is templated um, so it's it'll compile down to probably a huge whack of code um, so for embedded stuff I think it'll be a problem hmm. yeah. okay thanks a lot <laughs>